I'm Bishop Brian Keith Hodges. I pastor Gathering of Champions International Cathedral. I lead Gathering of Champions International Fellowship of Churches, and I am a part of Celebration of Praise as a bishop who is a part of the fellowship organization. Uh, uh, one of the things that's, that's been increasingly um, just jumping out is, is uh, with the recession, a lot of the saints are running into hard times. Um, mm -hmm. They're losing their houses and they can't pay their bills and and they're losing their faithfulness toward God. It's their, their ability to just stand fast. Mm -hmm. so, so what can you tell them to let them understand how important it is to not lose their faith, but to just stay plugged into God? Well, what is so interesting is uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that everything that has been has already happened before so there's nothing new under the sun there is a contrasting view of time time for birth and death time for happiness and sadness time for joy and sorrow and so on and we know that everything that has already happened it's a cycle it's coming around again essentially so my faith says this is just the period that God is stretching me to increase my capacity not stretching me because of sin or shortcomings not stretching me because it is a, a disciplinary action or engagement but stretching me to increase my capacity we know in America that wealth changes hands about every 10 years and this is the time where God is going to reestablish some people to establish some people who have never seen it before so this is not a bad time this is a good time secondly we are people who are kingdom participants so we live in the kingdom so our economy is not based on what happens on Wall Street the S&P 500 Nasdaq Dow Jones our faith continues to keep us connected to the kingdom so it's a good day in the kingdom now you think about it this way it's another contrasting view this is a bad day for some people but it's a great day for others those who are prepared it's a great day. Um, Joseph helped prepare Pharaoh and Israel for seven years of famine. And when the famine came, it was a great day for Israel, uh, Egypt, because Egypt was receiving now property, possessions, cattle from all those who had nothing. So even though it's a bad day in the larger context, for those of us who are faithful, who are disciplined in our finances, who are uh, friends of God, it's a great day for us. Opportunities are coming, things are happening. Um, there was a period in Israeli history when they went through a series of struggle and they could purchase uh, flour and grain for pennies. That was a time of great gain, even though it was it was encroached in a season of great destitution and, and poverty. It was a time of great gain, and one 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 amazing story that jumps out is Genesis 26, and God told, tells Isaac to sow in the land of Gerar, and it's in famine. Famine means there's not enough resources, that the ground is infertile, that the water is not available. So every condition that would show or tell a man not to sow, God says so. Because remember, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so ultimately, this is a season where God is stretching us to increase our capacity. When things turn around, this is a prophetic word I gave our church nine months ago. I said, uh, the housing market will turn around. The real estate market will turn around. The economy will turn around. And when it turns around, we're going to be riding on top of that turnaround. The rules are changing. With this um, unprecedented a downturn economically. The rules are going to change. And the people of God, I believe, are just going to come out on top. So my faith looks up to God, not out to my circumstances. Now you said something that was very that was interesting you said about sowing. Um, with the with the economic place the way it is, you know, people don't stop they stop sowing. Yes. I mean they they they'll keep their cell phones on, they'll sure. make sure they keep their cable on. Sure. But they stop sowing into the kingdom. Uh, uh, tell them how important it is that you continue to sow, that you continue to give, that you continue to to, to bless the kingdom of God and its people. One of the worst tragedies is to believe that you can pray for a harvest. You don't pray for harvest. You sow for harvest. Del Bronner says this, every time you sow a seed, you schedule a harvest. If you don't sow a seed, you can't get a harvest. Now you can have a great prayer life. You can have a life of great meditation. You can have a life of great solitude. But if you don't sow a seed, you can't reap a harvest. It's an immutable principle of the kingdom. As long as the earth remains, there'll always be seed time and harvest. And what that means is, there'll always be a cycle. If you sow, you will reap. That's the cycle. And that doesn't just necessarily mean money. I understand the context for which the scripture is saying. It's saying that the world is pitched in cycles and systems. Um, if we don't sow, we can't reap a harvest. That's just the bottom line. So when every time it's an opportunity for us to give, we sow and then we schedule. We actually anticipate that a harvest is going to show up. If you don't sow, you don't pray harvest down. You sow harvest up. And the more you sow, the more you shall reap. 
Now that's that's got to be based on somebody's faithfulness. And Absolutely. To understand that it's got to be based on their faithfulness to God. So 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 tell me, what does faith mean to you? I mean, people talk about being faithful, but when times get hard, then they try to do things on their own. All it means is it means to consistently maintain your relationship with God. For example, um, whatever God does, He does whether we praise Him or not. Whatever he provides, he provides whether we praise him or not. He is consistent. He is tied. He is yoked to us. You even think about the life of Abraham and David, just two uh, patriarchs specifically. Abraham, even when Abraham messed up, God was consistently good for him. Even when David messed up, he was consistently good for him. And the thing I love most about David is um, I teach at the university, and one of my students asked me on one occasion, they said, how do we know that David was restored? I said, one simple reason. He had Solomon. There's always going to be a king left to sit on the throne for David's generations. And that's how we know God restored him, because he had Solomon. He had someone to carry out the godly promise, the lineage, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, throne of David was established because of Solomon. Okay, for somebody who, 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 who don't know who you are, um, and, and you want to really put a word into them for the 2009 year, what would that word be? God is stretching us to increase our capacity. He's stretching us to increase our capacity. There will be a moment where heaven's windows open and there will be not enough room to receive. But God will stretch our capacity to increase us. You think about you and I. We only do what we do because we have, in our minds, caged ourselves in a capacity. Uh, you and I could play for the NBA or the NFL or whatever institution, we could play for them. But in our minds, we'd say right now, somebody came up and said, I want to recruit you to play for uh, the, um, the Hawks. You go, man, nah, get one of them young guys. Because that's, in our mind, we've limited our capacity. So we, we, know, we know what we are comfortable doing, and that's it. When God stretches your capacity, what things you have shut out of your mind as possibility, God reconnects you to those things. Dreams, visions, all those things that we've had in days gone by. God says, I'm stretching your capacity. Remember what Jabez asked, enlarge my territory, stretch my capacity. As a man now, this is all I can get from my birth, from the pain. I cause from my history this is all I can get but if you stretch my capacity you will allow me to get tap touch treat to uh, to tread across new areas that I've never uh, done before so that's what 2009 men of God is for me it's an increasing of capacity is stretching us so that we might do the work in the will of God and we can receive more from him so revelation insight knowledge understanding discipline discretion you name it wisdom God's doing that He's stretching us. And God never gives us something in the spiritual aspect without giving us something in the natural aspect. He's always calling us from something to something. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I got to watch that back myself. <laughs> 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 Woo! That's good. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Anything else you want to throw out there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, am, I just want the body of Christ to be encouraged. Our God is our God is God. We give him three immutable characteristics that we know about him. He is omniscient. He knows all. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Satan is not God's opposite. God has no opposites. God is God, the self-existing God. God already knows that we're in this issue in 2009. Barack Obama, wonderful man, but he is not our Savior. Our Savior is in Jesus Christ. And all we have to do in this hour, as simplistic as it may sound, as solution-oriented as it may sound, go back to the Word. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, Mark 11, believe you shall receive and you shall have it. Go back to that. This is the confidence, John. John chapter 5. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have to remember that if any two of us would agree on earth is touching anything, he would do it. These are basic salient principles. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. These are salient, substantive, substantial principles that if we practice them, we're going to get the result. And I'm just learning to be patient. I'll tell you a short story. I am a I am a car fanatic, car fanatic, and uh, I, I had my heart set on a '65 Mustang, and it was in my it was in my uh, the neighborhood of my daughter's school, and I rode past it. They wanted sixteen thousand. I waited six months. They wanted fourteen thousand. Waited six months. They wanted twelve thousand. Waited six months. They wanted ten thousand. Waited six more months. They wanted eight thousand. And finally, I just stopped and I wrote on there. I said, "Here's what I got cash 
for your for your car. If you want cash, call me. And the guy who took it, it was his son's car. He said, we ain't gonna take it. I said, just give it to him if you don't mind. The guy calls me a week later and says, if you got this cash, you can have this car. Now here's what happened. I saved over $10,000 on a car that I'm restoring because I learned how to wait. So God bless, wait. Ha <laughs> ha